Good evening, Suki Hotu. Thank you very much for joining us once again in this uh, awakening series. Today is uh, number four, <clears throat> number four in the series. We will be covering the topic awakening of the Bodhisattva. Okay, so without further ado, let me just share with you the link. You can download, uh, download this uh, PowerPoint uh, slides and you can follow along. I'm sorry, just give me one minute. I need to inform someone that I've gone live. Uh, sorry about that. I should have done that a moment ago, but it's okay. So just bear with me for two minutes. Sorry about that. Mm. Okay. Okay, my apologies for that. I uh, overlooked that. I promised someone that I'll inform them. So, okay. So today is uh, 21st of June. Thank you very much for joining us uh, in this awakening series number four. Today we will be covering a new topic, awakening of the Bodhisattva. And today I'm going to share with you why this is necessary and important before we, before we go into talk about the Paticca Samuppada. Eventually, this series is really about uh, elaborating the in-depth uh, explanation and translation of the Paticca Samuppada by Venerable Dr. Punaji. So we need to have some basic uh, foundations before we go into that. And this is one of those also, in addition to what we have covered in the past three weeks. Last three weeks, we covered uh, Pancha Kanda, the five aggregates, or what Bhante Punaji calls the five constituents of the process of perception. So today we will start a new topic, the awakening of the Bodhisattva, talking about how uh, Prince Siddhartha uh, underwent the whole process of learning from two teachers and then joining the ascetics, and then eventually finding out that ascetism doesn't work and by his own effort, he became enlightened or awakened. So today we will just look at the initial process of him pursuing the process of awakening. So this is really a, a, a little bit of a story also, storytelling. So let's get on with this. Eventually, we will talk about his awakening. So it is the awakening to Buddhahood of uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha. So when we say Bodhisattva, we are referring to Siddhartha, uh, as, uh, the Bodhisattva Siddhartha. Now, some people uh, say the word is Bodhisattva with a V, V-A, and some people say it's Bodhisattva. Actually, so Bodhisattva is the Sanskrit word and Bodhisattva is the Pali word. And generally in Theravada Buddhism, we use the Pali word rather than the Sanskrit word. Whereas in other, uh, other schools of Buddhism, they much prefer the Sanskrit version. So Bodhisattva and Bodhisattva are the same. I just say Bodhisattva, which is the Pali version. So basically, we will take a lot of material from this book, uh, Bhante Punaji's Arya Maga Bhavana, Level 3. I will give you the link at the end of today's sharing so you can download this book if you have not already downloaded. 
in the last three sharings i have offered the link so you would be able to have seen it if you had followed it one thing i need to remind those of you who are joining us either for the first time or who have skipped the first any of the first three sessions it is very important that you go through each of these sessions one by one in sequence because I'm not repeating very much that has already been said. These uh, awakening series, they are in a, a sequence that basically laid a foundation for some important foundational knowledge before we get into talking about the Paticca Samuppada. So if you miss any of these sessions, if you skip them, you would miss some important uh, information and some important uh, foundational knowledge okay so let's begin by talking about this awakening from the dream of existence Bhante Punaji always likes to call this the dream of existence because we are just dreaming that we exist and the Arahant is a person who has awakened from that thinking that I exist the Arahant no longer thinks like that now basically there are two ways that uh, can lead to the awakening from the dream of existence. And the first is the very straightforward way called Panya Vimutti. Vimutti normally means uh, liberation, emancipation, right? So basically, it helps us to be free from all suffering. So Panya Vimutti basically is awakening through insight, Panya. That means uh, insightful wisdom. We develop insightful wisdom and we become awakened. And how to do that? The Buddha showed the way and gave us the supernormal eightfold way. So when we follow the practice of this supernormal eightfold way, we will then reach, begin to go into the meditation path where we learn how to abandon the five hindrances. It's only by abandoning the five hindrances can we then move forward into this uh, four ecstasies or jhanas. Without abandoning the five hindrances, we will never be able to experience the jhanas. So once you get into experiencing the jhanas, you go, you cycle through the four stages of jhana. The first jhana, the second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. And when you reach the fourth jhana, you then go deeper in and you attain what is called upekka. And Bhante calls upekka as to be able to see the process of perception, not the object of perception. That means you're able to see how things come to be, how things arise and fade. And when you are able to fully comprehend that, then you are at the doorstep of awakening. So through that, you can then develop insightful wisdom. And this process of, of developing this insightful wisdom leads to emancipation, right? And so that is vidasana. Vipassana is just seeing the realities of life. Vidasana is not only just seeing, but fully comprehending, comprehending what you see. So. This is Panya Vimutti, and this is the way prescribed by the Buddha to help us become awakened from the dream of existence. But there is a second way, which is a much, much more difficult way, and that is called double awakening. I shall not attempt to pronounce that word, uh, yeah, because my Pali pronunciation is not very good. So it's called double awakening. Basically, this is the method by which the Buddha became enlightened, become awakened. And then he found that it, there is an easier way after he became awakened through this method. And this method involves a person who not only abandoning the five hindrances and going through the four jhanas, and then going beyond the jhanas and entering into four imageless realms. That means... Uh, there are now eight stages of samadhi. The four jhanas are four stages of samadhi. And then you go beyond the first four stages of samadhi, which are the jhanas. You go into the ayatanas. Unfortunately, many people call these 
the fifth, sixth, and seventh, eight jhanas. They are not jhanas anymore. When you get into the imageless realm, they are no longer jhanas. Because when we speak of jhanas, then uh, basically they are in the image realm, right? Uh, rupa samadhi. The imageless realm is the ayatanas, which is found in the arupa samadhis. So these are the arupa samadhis beyond the four jhanas. So they're not really called jhanas. We'll, we'll talk about that uh, in, the, in the next two uh, sharings. Today we will touch on that briefly, but we will go into a bit more in depth into that in the next uh, sharing. So today we will just briefly cover the process of attaining the jhanas, but uh, we, will, uh, we will talk more about that, okay? So what happens is after the four jhanas, going beyond the four jhanas, entering into the imageless realm, the arupa samadhis, then reaching the ultimate, right? After the four arupa samadhis, then you, have, you would have attained eight stages of samadhis. Then beyond that is stopping the mind altogether. And this process of absolutely stopping the mind is called sanya vedayita niroda. And when one's, one is able to stop that mind, and when one emerges from it, awakens from it, then one becomes awakened, becomes enlightened. And this is a very uh, powerful way of becoming awakened. And in, during the process of awakening, such a person would have observed and witnessed the complete process of co creation which is paticca samupada. That is how the mind creates. And Bande calls this paticca samupada the concurrence of logical antecedents. The popular translation is 12 links of dependent origination. But Bante gave it a very accurate uh, or very precise term, concurrence of logical antecedents. When we come to that, I will explain very clearly why Bhante calls this concurrence of logical antecedents. So meanwhile, we will just uh, put that aside. We will focus on the process of awakening. That means first uh, getting into the jhanas. So that's what we will cover today. Now this process, this, the double awakening, is what the Buddha actually went through. And very few of his disciples has accomplished that. And it seems uh, Mahamogalyana, uh, Venerable Mahamogalyana went through this. In other words, one who goes through this and awakened from this double awakening and on emerging from this double awakening, such an arahant would have developed some very powerful psychic power. Right? And that's why Mahamogalyana has these psychic powers, very powerful psychic powers. And the Buddha also has very powerful psychic powers. Now, we cannot easily know what are all the powers because the Buddha did warn us that there are four things we don't talk about that we cannot understand. We, as uh, non-enlightened people, uh, we will never understand and we will never understand the scope we will un never understand the depth of it, so we will not understand what are these psychic powers. So we don't have to discuss what they are and how uh, and the extent to which one can develop them. So just uh, realize that one who awakens through this process would have developed very powerful psychic powers. And that's what the Buddha did. So when the Buddha came out of this, and realized that this is very powerful way of awakening from his own personal wisdom, his own intelligence. Now, Siddhartha, before he became awakened, he was a very intelligent person. He was able to learn things very fast. And we're going to talk, talk about that today. Before he became the Buddha, he was a very fast learner and a very intelligent person. So, with that conventional intelligence, he actually devised this eightfold way to teach people the shortcut way how to become enlightened or how to become awakened. So the, 
supernormal eightfold way, the noble eightfold path. That is the Buddha's simplified way to help all his disciples to become enlightened in an easier way rather than go through this double awakening, which is very, very difficult to accomplish. Very, very few of his disciples have done that. Okay. So I hope that is clear. We will just focus on this Panya Vimuti for now. Uh, for the double awakening, it uh, basically requires the person to have attained the state of absolutely stopping the mind. And that was what Siddhartha, the Bod Bodhisattva, was trying to pursue, uh, trying to seek the absolute stopping of the mind. And from there, awakening from there, that person would be able to witness uh, the complete process of creation, the concurrence of logical antecedents, paticca samuppada. So this awakening to this paticca samuppada basically first requires the person to go through the four jhanas. So in other words, we need to abandon the five hindrances and go into the four jhanas. And these are the rupa samadhi. So you enter into this state of samadhi called the jhanas, four stages of them. And then from there, when one reaches the fourth jhana, one car develops the sata pojanga, the seven steps to awakening. From there, one is able to then uh, apply this sata pojanga and be able to observe and fully comprehend the arising and falling of realities. And this is the process of perception. And when one is able to see that, one is able to comprehend not only this process of perception, but also Patichasamopada. So this process, Panya Vimutti, is awakening through insight or deliverance through insight. So Panya Vimutti. Vimutti is awake, uh, deliverance, emancipation, right? Uh, and liberation from all suffering. That's what Vimutti means. So by practicing the seven steps to awakening, Sata Bojanga, one can then become awakened and become an Arahant. Or simply put, just a Buddha, uh, Arahant. It's the same in the Theravada tradition. Basically, it's the same. Unless someone is Sama Sambuddha, and that would be the Gautama Buddha, Sama Sambuddha. But the rest of his disciples who become awakened, including those who went through the other double awakening, like Mahamoglianas, they would be just regular, uh, they would be just Arahan and uh, regular Buddha, not Sama Sambuddha. So that is that process uh, to awaken from the dream of existence. And you can find that in this level three book on pages uh, 45 to 54. So you can find quite detailed explanation of all that written by Bandeponaji. And also included there is this other stage, the, re the double awakening. First, uh, upon completing the four jhanas, the rupa samadhi, one goes beyond the four jhanas, beyond rupa samadhi, entering into Arupa Samadhi, reduction of the cognitive process. And these are the ayatanas, a reduction of the cognitive process. And this process is called Cheta Vimutti or Cheto Vimutti. Basically, this is the uh, liberate, uh, deliverance of mind, okay, effectively liberated. And this is liber deliverance of mind. Cheto Vimutti. So that means there are two stages. After the fourth jhana, one would have attained the Panya Vimutti. Now going into here, that person will then attain Cheto Vimutti. That's why it's called double awakening. And then one reaches the state of Sanya Veda Ita Nirota, and that is stopping the mind, absolutely stopping the mind. And 
upon waking, waking up from there, awakening from the stopping of the mind, emerging from there, one can then witness the whole process of Paticca Samuppada and fully comprehend very deeply this process of Paticca Samuppada. So this is the double awakening. All right. And the other one is basically the awakening uh, through insight, deliverance through insight. Now let's talk about uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha. During his life as uh, Siddhartha, he saw the four great signs. He saw the old man. He saw a sick person. He saw a dead corpse. And finally, he came across an ascetic, a monk. And from these four great signs, he realized there's something he need to then uh, seek and discover. And since the dawn of civilization, the greatest problem to be solved by humanity is the problem of existence. That is birth, aging, sickness, and death. So Prince Siddhartha at that time realized that he had to find the solution to this. Right, how to awaken from this and free himself from this problem of existence. So he had to decide, he had to leave his home life because living in the palace, pampered by all the luxuries, there's no way he can ever become enlightened. So he realized he had to leave and detach himself from his family. So he took one last look at his wife and his newborn child and then he left the palace to seek enlightenment, going forth into homelessness. In one of the sutras, he was explaining to one of the people who asked him a question. Uh, in fact, it was a ascetic by the name of Sachaka. So he answered the question by saying, before myself awakening, when I was still just an unawakened bodhisattva, the thought occurred to me, household life is confining, a dusty path. Life gone forth is the open air. It isn't easy. Living in a home to practice the holy life, totally perfect, totally pure, a polished shell. What if I, having shaved off my hair and beard and putting on the ochre robe were to go forth from the household life into homelessness. So he was asking himself, household life is confining. There's no way that he can become awakened staying in the palace. He had to leave. So he decided that it's time to leave. And this is found in the Mahasachaka Sutta where this ascetic, Sachaka, asked uh, the Buddha some questions, and the Buddha was relaying to Sachaka how he became enlightened uh, as a bodhisattva. So this is really the awakening of the bodhisattva. And then he went on to explain the renunciation of bodhisattva Siddhartha, his own renunciation. When I was still young, black-haired, endowed with the blessing of youth in the first stage of life, having shaved off my hair and beard. Though my parents wished otherwise and were grieving with tears on their faces, I put on the ochre robe and went forth from the home life into homelessness. Now, at this point, I also want to point out, these are the words of the Buddha himself in the sutra. It is not in the commentary. So here, apparently, uh, the Buddha was describing the situation where his parents witnessed him leaving the home. It wasn't like, at see if, you know, there, there were people who say, oh, Prince Siddhartha in the middle of the night, in darkness, sneaked out of the palace and all that. No, he didn't do that. You can see in this statement, basically he says, uh, Though my parents wished otherwise and were grieving with tears on their faces, and I put on the robe 
and went forth into homelessness. So he actually left while his parents were witnessing and in tears. That's what it appears to be saying. You know, he was not saying that he left silently. But a lot of people say, oh, he, he sneaked out of the palace. No, that didn't happen. Maybe that is found in the commentaries, but this is what was found in the sutra. So we go by what is found in the sutra. This is the Mahasachaka Sutra, Majima Nikaya, Sutra number 36. Okay. So after leaving the palace and he went on his own, he put on the robe, shaved his head, and he started looking for teachers. He realized and heard there is this very famous teacher called Alara Kalama. So Bodhisattva Siddhartha found his first teacher, and that is Alara Kalama. Alara, Alara Kalama is a hermit, or was a hermit, hermit saint and teacher, and he specialized in ancient uh, philosophy at, uh, uh, at Vesali. So there, uh, Siddhartha, Bodhisattva Siddhartha, sought him as the teacher and wanted to learn from him in depth the methods of meditation. So Alara Kalama taught the Bodhisattva to attain that state of uh, meditative attainment called the realm of nothingless. Now I'm going to explain a little bit about these realms later, so I, I won't break the story. So the, the, the story is that Alara Kalama himself has attained that and he was able to teach Bodhisattva Siddhartha how to attain that. And as clearly uh, mentioned that Bodhisattva Siddhartha learned that and succeeded in attaining that. That means he was a very fast learner. He learned that. It didn't take him many years. It took Alara Kalama many years to attain that. But uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha learned it and very quickly attained that. So when he eventually attained the same level as his teacher, the Bodhisattva had become the equal of his teacher. In other words, he is already at the same level as Alara Kalama, the same level of attainment, having attained the realm of nothingness. Right? And uh, Alara Kalama realized that his student is now his equal. So he said to the Bodhisattva, as I am, so are you. As you are, so am I. What this phrase meant was that, that they are both now equal. Neither is superior to the other. So Alara Kalama went on to invite uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha. Come, friend, let us now lead this community together. In other words, he invited Bodhisattva Siddhartha to become uh, joint teachers. The two of them together would then teach and, and spread this Dharma to teach people how to attain that state. But Bodhisattva Siddhartha was actually seeking for something higher. He wanted to seek the highest and ultimate attainment. Of course, in those days, people were aware eh, that is this ultimate attainment and that one can then become an Arahant. So he was looking for that. So Siddhartha was seeking the ultimate attainment and realized that he could not continue with Alara Kalama because Alara Kalama could no longer teach him anything that he did not already know. So he left Alara Kalama and he went around and found another teacher who had knowledge of higher attainment. So he went to this second teacher, Udaka Ramaputta. Now it's important to recognize that the name Udaka Ramaputta, Udaka is the name of this second teacher. And his family uh, name would be Ramaputta. Ramaputta simply means the son of Rama because the word Putta uh, means son of or noble son of. Uh, at this point, I also want to diver, uh, digress slightly by saying many Asian languages 
uh, derive, especially languages in Malaysia, Sri Lanka, and various other places, uh, even in Thailand, some of the words in these, uh, some of the local words were adapted from Sanskrit. So was Pali. So putta is adapted from Sanskrit putra. And in Malaysia, the Bahasa Malaysia word putra means noble son of. It also means prince. So it is the noble son of. So you can see uh, Bahasa Malaysia shares a number of words common with uh, Pali, which are all derived from the, uh, the Sanskrit. So putra is the same as putra, and therefore you can see there are a lot of common words found in our language, which is basically derived also from Sanskrit, and this, uh, similarly almost the same as the Pali words. So Ramaputta is the noble son of Rama. So his second teacher is Udaka Ramaputta, the son of Putra. And uh, Ramaputra and uh, that is Udaka, together with his father Rama, they came from a lineage of giant uh, meditation teachers, very highly developed and highly skilled. And they taught very high state of meditation, very refined states of meditation, right? And these include all the Arupa Samadhis. So they specialize in the teaching of Arupa Samadhis. And Udaka himself uh, had also attained the same level as Alara Kalama. However, his father, Rama, had attained a higher level, and that would be the realm of neither sensation nor no sensation. And the realm of nothingness that was attained by Udaka Ramaputta as well as uh, Kal Alara Kalama, that was actually the seventh uh, state of Samadhi. So that would be the third Arupa Samadhi. Whereas uh, realm of neither sensation nor no sensation is the fourth Arupa Samadhi, and, or rather the eighth stage of Samadhi, right? Uh, it is the Ayatana. And this is why they are called the Ayatanas. You can see in the Pali name, the realm of nothingness, Akincha Nyayatana. And the realm of neither sensation nor no sensation, Nevasanya Nasanyatana, okay? So basically, they are called ayatanas. They are not jhanas, right? So these are arupa samadhis. Jhanas are rupa samadhis, right? Image realm, whereas uh, ayatanas are imageless realm, a higher stage. So Siddhartha, the bodhisattva, having attained already, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Siddhartha learned the method from uh, Udaka, because Udaka learned the method from his father. By that time, uh, there was no mention in the sutra that Rama was actually the person teaching uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha. So I guess we can safely assume that by that time, when, uh, when Siddhartha uh, came to Udaka Ramaputta, the senior Rama had already uh, passed away, perhaps, right? So there was no mention. Uh, it was mentioned that Udaka Ramaputta was the teacher, not Rama. However, this technique, this method, this teaching came from Rama. So you could safely say, in a way, uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha learned the method from Rama through Udaka. So Udaka taught the method passed down by his father, Rama, and then Siddhartha learned that and became uh, successful at that, whereas Udaka Ramaputta was still not able to attain that. So now, uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha had already attained something higher 
than what Udaka was able to accomplish. Even those Udaka Ramaputta knew this method earlier on. He taught it to Siddhartha, now Siddhartha had attained it, whereas Udaka Ramaputta was still uh, striving for it. So still seeking this ultimate attainment, uh, Siddhartha decided to leave uh, Ramaputta. Because by the time uh, Siddhartha had attained this, he realized he was no longer the equal of Udaka Ramaputta. He, he, uh, and in fact, Udaka, it was said in the sutra, Udaka Ramaputta paid uh, homage to Siddhartha and in fact uh, acknowledged Siddhartha to now become his teacher. He wanted Siddhartha to be his teacher because Siddhartha had already attained that higher level that Udaka himself was not able to attain. But uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha was seeking for the ultimate attainment. So he decided it's time to leave. He could no longer stay on with Udaka Ramaputta and, and treat Udaka Ramaputta as a student. He decided to leave. So now, before we continue with the story, let's digress a little bit. It's important for us all to be reminded this very important thing. I have already spoken about this many times, the three parts of mental experiences. I will not go into detailed explanation anymore. Just very quickly, the Buddha used three words to describe the mind. Vijnana simply means the process of perception where one becomes aware of what was perceived through the sense organ. One became aware of what was seen, heard, smelled, tasted, touched, and then remembered and imagined. So the six, uh, the, the six sensual realms, right? Salayatana. So Vijnana basically referred to this awareness of uh, what was perceived. The second word the Buddha used was mano, referring to cognition and conception. Basically, it was able to identify and uh, assign names to what had been perceived. What was perceived appeared in the mind as a mental image, rupa, and the name given or label to, uh, assigned to it was to identify what it is, and that is the nama of what was perceived, nama rupa. And at the same time, one is able to then uh, cognize this experience and create concepts. And from concepts, it leads to having choices of what to do, how to respond to the concepts. So it's cognition and conception. Finally, the third word the Buddha used, chitta, was referring to mood and temperament. This is commonly called the affective process. And this generally, the lay term for this is emotions, right? So basically, when one, uh, this aspect of the mind, the third part of mental experience, is this affective process which actually leads one to react emotionally, emotional reaction, tanha, to what was experienced, whether it felt uh, pleasant or unpleasant. And, and it leads to mood, which means whether we like something or we don't like something, and temperament, our urge to react. And these are emotional states, leading to anger, despair, greed, right? shame and so on, all kinds of emotional states. So this is really chitta, the emotional mind, affective process, whereas mano is the thinking mind, the cognitive process. And this chitta also leads us to personalize every experience, upadana, right? That means clinging on, grasping, attaching to every experience, saying, I experience this, I like this, I don't like this, the I, me or mine arises. So this is really the work of the chitta. The, this, and this leads us into the delusion of a self-centered existence, bhavatanha, this reaction to uh, self-centered existence is bhavatanha, right? So basically these are the three aspects of the mind or the three uh, mental experiences of the mind. The thinking mind is the mano, and the emotional mind is the chitta. These two minds are pulling in opposite direction. The chitta 
disturbs the mano by driving the mano to react in emotional ways to feelings whether something is pleasant or unpleasant the chitta then disturbs the mano and causes the mano to then uh, react in a way uh, choosing or creating concepts associated with emotional thinking or emotional thoughts and then uh, choosing reactions which are emotional in nature so the chitta is disturbing the mano the purpose of meditation is really to tame the chitta to calm the chitta so that it doesn't disturb the mano so having said that let's then move on i think i have explained these three parts of mental experiences many times you can go back to the past uh, past uh, sessions and you will find much more deeper explanations so let's now talk about this uh, development of samadhis how one then develops samadhis we are living in this sensual realm karma bhava that means we are aware of sensuality sensual our five senses five physical senses and our mind which responds to these sensual experiences right so we are living in this sensual realm karma bhava and in this sensual realm we experience uh, uh sense perceptions which then are uh, they are pleasant or unpleasant and we react to it that's why this word karma refers to sensuality not uh, our action karma this is sensuality and in this sensual realm if we want to progress further in meditation what we need to do is develop our ability to abandon the five hindrances the five hindrances are basically emotional processes right from the chitta that disturbs the mano so in other words the five hindrances are the work of chitta and they disturb the thinking mind mano so in order for the mind to become pure uh, purified we have to tame the chitta and bring the chitta to a state of stillness and by stilling the chitta we are able to abandon these five hindrances and having abandoned the five hindrances we then develop five uh, constituents of jhanas right bante called jhanas ecstasy and you will see later in a short video bante's explanation why he calls it uh, ecstasy okay so basically this all happens in the karma bhava the sensual realm as we meditate we are still in the sensual realm as we go deep in and we abandon the five hindrances develop the five constituents and then we move on to the next stage right the five in five constituents of jhanas would be the five janangas vitaka vichara right vitaka is often translated as applied thought basically bante punaji explain it as inference i'll come to this uh, more detail later vitaka vichara and then pt which is commonly translated as rapture bante calls it cognitive satisfaction cognitive contentment right that means the mind is at peace and contented the mind is not discontented the mind is not restless and then uh, sukha which means the body is comfortable and still the body is not excited and, and there's no tensions in the body anymore sukha and then finally ekagata which is basically a state of stillness of mind and because the mind is still the mano and the chitta the two mind come together and become unified i'll talk more about this in the next sharing because to understand this it's uh, a, a little bit deeper we'll come to that in the next sharing but today we will just very quickly lo look through the five uh, janangas and when one has develop these five janangas one moves into this imagery realm rupa bhava and in the rupa bhava what it is doing is it is the reduction of the chitta that means calming and taming the chitta eventually bringing the chitta to a complete standstill complete stillness reducing the chitta to complete stillness 
That's why it's reducing the chitta. That means the chitta no longer is active. And when the chitta is still, it is working hand in hand together with mano. And that's why they call this the ultimate attainment in jhanas is unification of the mind. What is unification? Uniting. Uniting what? Chitta and mano. That is the unification. A lot of people say unification of mind, unified mind, but they would not be able to explain unifying what? Because when you say unifying, it's basically coming together, union, union of two or more together. So in this case, it's union of chitta and mano becoming one. The two becoming one. The mind is now flowing in one direction. That's called ekagata, right? So this is really the process uh, of jhana, eventually or ultimately to unify the two minds. By doing so, it is reducing the chitta to, to basically to be the same as the mano, the two are one, no longer separated. And there are four jhanas, right? The first, the second, the third, the fourth, Jhanas. They are called jhanas because each one has a name, and you can see the name is called jhana. So these are four jhanas. These are the rupa uh, samadhi. Right, so these are the four jhanas, and basically one can cultivate and develop these, and then finally reach the fourth jhana. When you have reached the fourth jhana, you are at the doorstep of uh, awakening already you are very close to awakening you just need to go one step more and then that's awakening okay so let's now take a look at a, a quick video by Bante talking about uh, Samadhi where he explained Samadhi is not the uh, concentration so this is why it is very important to understand that samadhi is not concentration. Most people translate it as concentration. Samadhi is not concentration, it is a state of mental equilibrium. Now when you reach that state of mental equilibrium, that is called entering the jhana. Entering the jhana. And what is the meaning of jhana? Now again, a lot of people think jhana is a state of concentration. Jhana is not concentration. Jhana is what is called a withdrawal. We, now if I go out of this room and st stay at the door outside, that is called standing out. That standing out is called ecstasy. The word ecstasy is usually understood as getting excited. It is not getting excited. It is standing out of all excitement. That means calming the mind. All the emotional excitement you are getting out of it. That is standing out. So you are withdrawing from the world of emotional excitement. It's a withdrawal and standing out. So the first ecstasy 
is to stand out of the emotional world. And once you have been standing out, you are still thinking, you can form concepts, but those concepts are not concepts that create emotional excitement. It is like this is breathing in, that is a concept. This is breathing out, that is a concept. This is relaxing the body, the body becomes relaxed, that is a concept. So, by observing something, we begin to ask the question, what is this? And then we answer the question. That is the meaning of vitakka and vichara. Vitakka is answering the question and vichara is asking the question. So every concept that we form is answering, answering the question asking the question, Vitak and Vichar. Bhante puts it, uh, asking and answering a question. He made it very simple, simplified. Uh, so that is a, a very simplified way of explaining Vitaka Vichara. But what it is, is that when we perceive something, or when something arises in our mind, Vichara is basically uh, inquiring, what is this? And then Vitaka is basically then defining what it is, right? interpreting what it is. So Vichara is inquiry and Vitaka is inference. Right? So uh, let's now talk about that first part what Bhante was talking about. One has to abandon the five hindrances in order to enter into jhana. And jhana is standing out of emotional world, right? Standing out. That's why Bhante calls it ecstasy, right? Ec means standing out, right? So basically, uh, imagine in a room, let's say the room is the world we live in where we have sensual, sensuality, emotions, the room of emotions. Ecstasy is to stand out, which means now you withdraw away from emotional mind. So taking the mind out of emotional process. So the emotional processes are the five hindrances. So these are the five hindrances. So let's look through one by one. The first one is Kama Chanda. Kama Chanda is um, talking about wish and desire for pleasant experiences, right? Basically, karma is uh, talking about these sensual pleasures and chanda is the desire for it, the aspiration, the wish to have it. Vyapada and Vyapada, they are spelled interchangeably, but it means the same thing. It means experiencing something unpleasant or displeasures, we then feel un unhappy about it and we become angry about it, ill will, we want to get rid of it. So trying to get rid of something means you're having an ill will towards it. You're trying to eliminate it. So basically trying to get rid of something. And sometimes uh, you're just get, uh, feeling anger. And then if you can't get rid of it, you, get, you, you feel hatred towards it. So this is about uh, our response to unpleasant experiences. The third one is this state where we become sluggish, lethargic, and drowsy. And this leads us to become sleepy when we meditate. And if we are tired and we are not uh, focusing our attention well enough, we are allowing our attention to slip. We fall into a state of sluggishness and lethargy and drowsiness sets in. We may even doze off. That's why some people try to meditate and then they doze off. And this, this state of the mind getting, well, some people call it lazy, but actually it's just drowsiness. 
So this state is often translated as sloth and topo. But uh, that is giving a slightly wrong impression. Sloth means very lazy. But it's not necessarily lazy. It could also be because you're tired. So you're tired and you become sleepy. So it is not necessarily sloth. Sloth is a very powerful word, a very strong word for laziness. So it's not necessarily out of laziness. It could be drowsiness. The other extreme is the mind is hyperactive, agitated, restless, full of anxiety and worry. And that is udacha kukucha, right? Agitation, restlessness, anxiety, and worry. And finally, the mind is unsettled, unable to understand clearly right from wrong, good from bad, what is what. So it's being torn. The mind is experiencing what is called vacillation, right? Being torn, right? Being torn between different views, being torn between emotional and thinking. You realize something is unpleasant, yet. Uh, and that is your thinking mind, realizing something is not good for you. At the same time, you have an emotional need to want to satisfy your emotions. So you can't decide whether to do this or to do that. And today, we have many examples. In Malaysia, right now, we are under uh, full movement control or the, our full lockdown. We, we usually can't go out much. We can't travel too far away. We can only go to the supermarket. And yet, we have an urge to want to visit our very good friends uh, or, or something like that. So there is an emotional need of wanting to see a friend or a relative or even our own parents may be living some distance away. And yet, the knowledge, the realization that we are under lockdown. So the knowledge is pulling in one direction, the emotions are pulling in the other direction, so you could not decide. That is vijikicha, vacillation. So you, for example, you take the five precepts, and the five precepts tell you that, uh, that, uh, that uh, the five precepts basically tell you that you should not harm living things. And then you sit there uh, at night trying to sleep, and then this mosquito comes comes and disturb you. You try to chase it away. It keeps coming. After 10, 20 times trying to chase it away, what do most people do? They then submit themselves to their emotional uh, reaction. That's it. They kill the mosquito. So what they have done is basically now uh, harm a living thing. And this desire to kill that mosquito, that is your emotional thing. But at the same time, your mind reminds you, I have taken the five precepts. I should not be harming any living thing. So the mind could not decide for a while. Finally, the mind went towards the emotional side. So these are the five different types of emotional disturbances, the emotional processes that we need to abandon, suppress and abandon. Now, we cannot... As a normal and enlightened being, we cannot completely eliminate them. But by practicing, abandoning them, suppressing them, reducing them, eventually we would be able to manage them and not allow them to disturb us too much. But we will still have these. Only an arahant, a person who is fully enlightened, would have completely eliminated and got rid of all the hindrances. But otherwise, when we are meditating, we would have abandoned the five hindrances. But when we come out of meditation, go back to our normal uh, conventional lifestyle, then these five hindrances arise again. So now, um, what happens is that uh, Siddhartha, Bodhisattva Siddhartha, practicing meditation, uh, he wanted to take it one step further because he tried to practice uh, learning from the two teachers. He realized that uh, they were not able to teach him the ultimate, uh, ultimate attainment, the highest attainment of stopping the mind, Sanya Vedayita Niroda. Then he went and practiced ascetism. 
and I will explain next week uh, in more detail his practice of ascetism. But just suffice to say for now, he went and practiced ascetism and then um, he was still not able to attain the highest level. And in fact, he practiced so extremely that his, uh, he finally fainted. He nearly died from it because he was trying to stop his breathing. First, he tried to stop eating. And then he tried to stop breathing, and finally he nearly died. Then he 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 did not uh, actually die. Of course, he did not die. But in his very weak state, he realized that he needed to take some food, and he got out of that and started to take some food. Right. So now let's take a look at this uh, uh, short video. Um, so when at the age of nine, his father allowed him out to celebrate the annual plowing festival, he eagerly participated. His first glimpse of reality beyond the palace walls would open a door for Siddhartha to a new vision of the world and would become the turning point of his life. The story recalls that he watched a farmer plowing. He saw the toil and effort struggle and repetition of this back-breaking work, something he'd never seen in the palace. He managed to slip away from the festivities and be alone. This first experience of real life had a profound effect upon him. To everyone else, this was a celebration. But to Siddhartha, it symbolized something quite different. He felt his mind leading him into a contemplative state. He watched the plough as it cut and parted the ground, and noticed a bird eating a freshly unearthed worm. He asked himself why living beings have to suffer in this way. If the farmer had not been ploughing, the bird would not have eaten the worm. He realised that everything was connected, and that all actions had consequences. This simple observation would become one of the cornerstones of his teachings, known as karma. As Siddhartha's mind focused on these profound thoughts, he slipped into a trance, or jhana, a mental state which would become his first step on the road to enlightenment. He was sat under a tree, and he just focusing on the plough going through the earth. And it's said that while doing that, he fairly naturally went into a meditative state called the first jhana, which was very, very joyful and happy, and which he later uses as part of his spiritual path. The connection to Buddhist meditation is the focusing on something, which has a calming, centering effect. Possibly also the idea of compassion for the worms being killed as the plough went through the earth. So he remembered as a child uh, when uh, the people left, when he went out with his father to the village and the people who were minding him left him alone and he was just observing, his mind was just focused on observing uh, the plough going through and he saw the whole cycle that he, he recognized is the whole process of karma and because he was so focused on the action of the plough, he went very deep into, uh, uh, into his mind and eventually attained deep jhanas, okay? So uh, he observed cause and effect in action. And observing the plowing activity, his mind then went deep into a state of jhanic state, the jhana. Because in that whole observation process, he had stilled his mind. His, uh, basically, his emotional mind had stopped and he was just observing what's going on and comprehending the realities of what's going on and focusing his attention on his own thoughts. He started to realize uh, the realities of life and one of the realities of life as such a child, nine-year-old child at the time, was this insightful comprehension of karma how karma comes to be, right? So basically that is, uh, that was the experience and by remembering that experience, the Bodhisattva Siddhartha then realized, 
I can do it by myself. I don't need a teacher. And that's when he went on to try it out himself. Okay. So those five uh, constituents of jhana, jhanas or ecstasies, they are called janangas. Jananga is the term used to refer to these five constituents of ecstasy, five constituents of jhanas. We need to develop them and, 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 and then basically together they will lead us into this experience of jhana, the jhanic state. So vitaka is basically the attention on focusing and concluding and rational deduction and reflection on thoughts. Uh, then vichara is the conceptual inquiry, the attention on examining, inquiring, investigating, evaluating. Right? And that was what young Siddhartha as a child was doing. He was observing the plowing and then asking, why is it plowing? Uh, what is going on? And then the seeds, the birds, and so on, the worms. Right? So he was examining that. So vitaka vichara are these conceptual thoughts arising. Now, I, I must point out, Vitaka Vichara is not referring to any type of thoughts. It's basically what you're focusing on, right? Uh, the thoughts that you are aware of arising. And then this is about the mind being contented, rapture. PT is rapture, contentment of the mind, cognitive satisfaction, a state of cognitive satisfaction we call a rapture, resulting from the absence of emotional excitement. Now, the word rapture sometimes uh, has been misunderstood as some kind of, oh, I'm very happy, that kind of thing. That is an emotional excitement. That's not rapture. Rapture is a very peaceful state of mind, right? It's basically a peaceful state of mind of contentment, no excitement. Right? No tensions, no excitement. This is basically the mind being contented. And then uh, sukha is about the body being relaxed and in a state of comfort. No tension, no physical excitement, no, right? no, no disturbances, right? no physical disturbances of any sort. State of complete relaxation of body tensions resulting from the absence of tensions that arouse excitement. So there's no excitement, complete, very still, both body and mind. The two uh, need to be developed. And finally, uh, ekagata is when the mind has reached that state of stillness, right? the two mind become one. So stillness of mind uh, is the absence of the mind uh, fighting. The, the mano and the chitta is fighting. That is called vichikicha. When that is completely absent, then... That is called cognitive, uh, that fighting is called cognitive dissonance. When that is absent, it is called cognitive consonance. So another word for ekagata is cognitive consonance. Right? Stillness of the mind, the two minds are unified. So basically, it is completely free from mental conflict of any sort between the chitta and the mano, and therefore the two are unified as one, unification of mind. So these are the five constituents of jhanas. Now let's listen to Bande Punaji explaining the process of the four jhanas. The first thing to understand is that normally people are living in an emotional world. That means we have all kinds of emotional relationships. To have friends is an emotional relationship. To have enemies is also an emotional relationship. And uh, all kinds of relationships, uh, either with uh, inanimate objects, or maybe animate objects. We can be related. That is an emotional relationship. So, the first thing we do is 
we are now trying to stop this relationship. So that is the first part, which is to stop the emotional relationship. That getting rid of emotions. That is the first stage where we say we get into the jhana, jhana which we call ecstasy. Ecstasy means standing out. It's like uh, you get out of this room and stand outside. So like that we stand out of the emotional world. You come out of the emotional world. That is the ecstasy. So, in order to get out of that emotional world, there are five blocks to this, like a fence. There is a fence that blocks these two and we have to get out of that. Those are what are called the five hindrances. So when we have got rid of the five hindrances, it is like a wall, we come out of that wall. So we have to do a lot of meditation in order to get rid of the five hindrances. And once we have got out of the five hindrances, now we are in the first jhana, first ecstasy. And in that first ecstasy, we are free of emotions, but we have what is called thinking going on, thinking. Yeah, no emotions, but there is thinking. We cycle through the four jhanas. Let's take a look at the five constituents. In the first jhana, all five components, five constituents are present. Now, there is conceptual thought. This is not emotional thought. This is conceptual thought, being aware, uh, having attention on focusing on your thoughts. And when you are able to relinquish them, you, you let go the thinking process of vitaka and vichara, you then move into the second jhana. In the second jhana, you still have piti, sukha, ekagata. Right? And then you give up piti, you go to the third jhana, you give up sukha, you finally reach the fourth jhana. So let's look at the, uh, listen to Bhante explain these jhanas uh, and the unification of the mind, and then uh, we'll explain further the whole process, right, of cycling through. So when we get out of the thinking, we are in the second jhana or ecstasy. When we get into the second ecstasy, we are free of even thinking. Thinking means, if I look at this and say, oh, what is this? This is a cup. That is thinking. But that is not emotional thinking. So that thinking which is not emotional also we stop. And we may see things, but we don't think about what we see. We don't question what is this, and we don't come to a conclusion, this is a cup. But we can see the cup. That is in the second jhana. When you come to the third jhana, <coughs> we don't 
we we in that second jhana we feel very happy which is the mental state of happiness so we give up the mental state of happiness also when we come to the third jhana because we want to be calm even happiness is seen as a small excitement so we become more calm and we stop the happiness part when we come to the fourth jhana we give up even the happiness and the comfort we are left with comfort when we give up happiness we feel comfortable physically is a physical state comfort happiness is a mental state so when we give up the mental state of happiness we begin to feel comfortable now we give up the comfort also that does mean we become uncomfortable it's only a very calm restful state and that comfort is also given up and then we are in the fourth jhana fourth ecstasy now uh, when we get into the fourth ecstasy what we are having is only that unification of mind the mind is united that means it is not divided into two that is the meaning of being united the mind is not broken into two parts one going against the other so it's unification so basically bante was describing that process of cycling through the four jhanas let's now take a look at a diagram right on the left most column if you look down the column of first jhana those are the five constituents so when you're able to develop these five constituents uh these five janangas you are into the first jhana and this is the gradual withdrawal of chitta that means eventually chitta is completely gone but here chitta is not eliminated because you are not yet an arahant you you basically have put chitta to a state of stillness right it's uh, almost like giving anesthetic and then the person goes to sleep so here uh this training this process will put chitta basically to sleep so to speak so still in the chitta so it's the gradual process of reaching a state where there is only a complete unification of mind so as you uh let go right withdraw from vitaka and vichara and then you begin to move into the second jhana as you withdraw from this uh, pt which is the cognitive contentment or rapture as they call it then you are into the third jhana but you still have this comfort of the body then bante basically says when you then withdraw from this sukha the comfort of the body you are into the fourth jhana and bante basically described this withdrawal as it's not like uh, making it disappear but basically making it into a neutral state right so now finally in the fourth jhana there is only ekagata from the ekagata it then develops further into upeka and that i will talk about in the next sharing right i think uh, it is suffice to say uh, we have we've gone quite deep into this topic next sharing i'm going to talk about this gradual reduction uh, from another perspective to explain this gradual reduction so that you understand more clearly how stepping through each stage of jhanas okay so now at the fourth stage you have only ekagata
when we get into the second ecstasy, we stop asking questions and we stop answering questions. That is, we stop conceptual thinking. We might see something, we don't look at the thing and say, what is this? Oh, this is a camera. Oh, what is this? This is a face. We don't think like that. So we may see things, but we don't ask questions and answer questions. That means no conceptual thinking. When that happens, we are in the second jhana, second ecstasy. But still we are left with preeti and ekagata. Preeti is that happiness and ekagata is the unity or the unification of the mind. So when you enter the second jhana or ecstasy, you have the happiness and the comfort and the unification of the mind. When you enter the third jhana, you give up that happiness. That doesn't mean that you become unhappy, but you get into a neutral state. Because happiness at that point is seen as an excitement. So you calm down. And then you are left with comfort and the unity of the mind. Comfort. Then when you get on to the next step, you give up the comfort also. That doesn't mean that you become uncomfortable, but it's a neutral state. And that is, the mind becomes more tranquil. These are degrees of tranquility of the mind. So every step upwards, it's like climbing a flight of steps. And when you climb a flight of steps, you give up the first step to get into the second step. You give up the second step to get into the third step. You give up the third step to get into the fourth step. That's how it goes. So it's a gradual withdrawal. And when you come to the fourth step, the fourth ecstasy, your mind is completely focused on one thing. So now we take a look at going beyond the fourth jhana, right? Beyond the fourth jhanas, what happens? So that in the jhana, you are in the rupa bhava, the image realm. That is the imagery uh, samadhi, right? Rupa samadhi. Going beyond that, you are entering into the arupa samadhi, and that is the arupa uh, uh, imageless realm. And there, you are now reducing even the mano part of the mind, the, the, uh, the cognitive process. Earlier on, in the jhanas, you were reducing the affective process, the chitta. Now you are now withdrawing the mano completely. And eventually, there is no more, you know, mano is no longer active, which means you have stopped the mind completely. Right? That is the whole goal of this. So these are the four stages of arupa samadhis, realm of infinite space. I will explain this a bit more detail uh, in the next sharing. I'll just quickly run through to show you realm of infinite space, realm of infinite perception, and then realm of nothingness, 
And finally, the realm of neither sensation nor no sensation. At this state, realm of neither sensation nor no sensation, the mind is so subtle, it almost disappeared. It's on the verge of disappearing. It's, it's, neither, it's neither having any kind of activity nor uh, no activity. You know, it's at the, at, the, at the threshold of disappearing completely. And when it has reached that point, the next thing that happens is that you now can take it to a stop, to an absolute stopping. And that is Sanya Vedayita Niroda. This is the ultimate attainment. This is the complete cessation or absolute cessation of all sensation and feeling. All Sanya and all Vedana have completely stopped. This is stopping the mind. There is no consciousness. This is a mind that is completely stopped. That's why Bhante calls this insentience. Insentience refers to a mind that has completely no awareness, nothing. The mind is completely stopped, right? absolutely stopped. And basically, you can only last seven days in this state. I will explain a bit more about this in the next sharing. I won't go much deeper now. So realize that is the state that uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha was trying to attain. And finally, on his own, he reached that state. When he woke up from that, he saw the Paticca Samuppada. Right? Alara Kalama and Udaka Ramaputta, both of them had attained the realm of nothingness. But Udaka Ramaputta had the method from his father. Rama of the next state, but uh, Siddhartha was not uh, satisfied with reaching there. He he wanted to reach that final state of Sanya Vedayita Niroda, the ultimate attainment. And when he awakes from that, he became the Sama Sambuddha. Okay, so that is basically uh, what I have for today. Uh, just quickly summarize, there are two ways to awaken from the dream of existence. The, the way that the Buddha has taught us is the Eightfold Way leading to Panya Vimutti, awakening through insight. That means you, you develop Vidasana and then you become an Arahant. The second way is a much more difficult way that the Buddha went through. And as you heard earlier on Bhante's explanation, what the Buddha did was that having gone through double awakening, he realized that other people probably would never be able to achieve this. That's why he was saying that, uh, that people have dust in their eyes. They cannot achieve this. And then when he thought about it, he realized that there is an easier way and he came up with this eightfold way, the supernormal eightfold way. And then he taught his disciples the eightfold way. And that was the, the way he taught. So that is the end of today's sharing. Thank you very much for your attention. Don't forget to download the presentation slides. And also this book, uh, the Arya Maga Level 3, where all these are written inside there. So please uh, remember to download them and look through. If you have any more questions, please feel free to send to me through email. Or uh, you can message me in Facebook. Uh, I can see there are no questions at the moment. So I thank you very much for joining us. We spent the last one and a half uh, hours or so together. So let us all, uh, we have accumulated quite a bit of merits from doing this. There are many people suffering around the world uh, from the pandemic. So let us all put our palms together and share our merits with those who are suffering from coronavirus pandemic. We dedicate the merits we have acquired from sharing the Buddha Dharma to all beings affected by the coronavirus pandemic around the world. May suffering beings be suffering free. May the fear struck fearless be. May grieving beings shed all grief. May all beings find peace and relief. By the grace of the merits we have acquired, may we never follow the foolish, 
may we follow only the wise until we attain the highest and most supreme bliss of Nibbana. Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo. Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo. Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Thank you very much. I wish you uh, stay safe and uh, may you be well, comfortable, peaceful, and happy. And good night. Sadu, sadu, sadu.